to be here and a welcome to you. Um, is it anybody's birthday today? Oh! Five. Happy birthday, Dorothy. <laughs> it was my little girl's birthday yesterday, but she's a bit more than five now. Um, so, uh, this morning um, I'll be leading and bring God's word to us from um, Zephaniah. And uh, just a few notices. Um, Mariam has requested the meeting of those involved in the crash or the children's work um, upstairs in, in the hall after the meeting. Um, grab your coffee and have a chat. Uh, there's a trustees meeting um, on Tuesday. Do pray for us as we meet to talk through and pray about the work of the church here. And Thursday, we have um, the return of Matthew Cox, uh, who will be speaking to us uh, on another one thing in the scriptures, and it's from um, uh, 1 to Peter. And uh, I've really enjoyed his talks um, this will be the, the, the last one of four. So if you haven't heard him yet, do do tune in if you can. Well, let's let's turn to to worship and praise. I'd like to read Psalm 100, just a few verses, four verses, five. Sorry, can't count. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's pray as we commit our morning to him. Lord, we would enter your gates with thanksgiving and come into your courts with praise. And we would give thanks to you and praise your name for you are good. You are God. You are the Lord. And Lord, we come to give you our thanks and praise this morning as we meet together. We ask for your help. We pray that you draw near to us and let us know that you're here and that you will do us good. But we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's uh, start with singing um, our first song. Last week, uh, Adrian um, got us to stand to sing, and I thought that was good. So uh, let's do that again, and it's uh, Behold Our God Seated on His Throne. So let's uh, stand and sing, uh, and not sing this song together.
Isn't that a tremendous song? And uh, can't wait for the day when we can sing properly. Well, um, we're going to, I'm going to read uh, a few verses from the prophet Zechariah. And uh, if you've got a Bible and you can find it, uh, do please follow. Um, oh, thank you, Ollie, that's a great help. Um, there are, I think, 12 so-called minor prophets and uh, Zephaniah <coughs> is the um, eighth or ninth one. And we're going to read um, from the last chapter, chapter 3, verses 9 to the end. And uh, in the NIV, the, the passage is entitled, Restoration of Israel's Remnant. Then I will purify the lips of the peoples, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshippers, my scattered people will bring me offerings. On that day, you, Jerusalem, will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me, because I will remove from you your arrogant boasters. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill, but I will leave within you the meek and humble, the remnant of Israel, will trust in the name of the Lord. They will do no wrong and, and will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down and no one will make them afraid. Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Zion, uh, they will say to Jerusalem, do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and a reproach for you. At that time, I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honour in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honour and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes. Well, that's the passage, and we're going to be looking at verse 17 in particular a little later on. Now it's the time for the, the children and uh, those involved in the, the work uh, with the children, time for you to leave. Why don't you, if you can, just turn around and greet somebody from behind your mask, as we, we used to do. So say hello. That's great, isn't it? Let's uh, spend a few minutes in, in prayer together. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you're on the throne and we do adore you. We worship you as our great God. Lord, you've got the whole world in your hands. And Lord, you know how this world is suffering and struggling under the impact of this awful epidemic. 
And so we, we do pray, Lord, for countries where they're really having it uh, difficult. Lord, we think of India and uh, the Philippines and many other places, Lord, where uh, the, the virus is rampant and uh, people are struggling. Oh, Lord, in your mercy, please um, help them. And uh, Lord, we, we, we pray that uh, soon the vaccinations will be effective and um, people will be able to get back to normality. Lord, we pray for our government as they have an important decision to make in the coming week. Lord, they have, all, have had all sorts of problems, changes in personnel. Oh Lord, we are a fallen people. But we do pray for our leaders as they have to decide when we uh, come out of lockdown and they try to plot a route back to normality. Lord, we ask that you help them and give them wisdom. And Lord, we pray that, we, that things will return and we can um, meet as we would like and that uh, everything else will get back to, to normal again. Oh Lord, we uh, thank you that we can pray for our government and we do. We ask that they will lead us. And we do pray about this um, abortion uh, amendment that they want to bring into a bill next week. We pray that it won't go ahead. We pray that there will be some uh, security, that the, the present safeguards for abortion will not be uh, wiped away as some want. And we, Lord, we thank you that we can look forward to Matthew Clay coming among us in um, just a couple of months' time. And we pray for him as he's so busy at the moment in um, uh, Great Harbour. Lord, help him today and at the funeral he takes tomorrow. And we pray that you help him and Hannah to sort out the selling of the house and schools for the girls to attend when they move south. And we commit them to you, Lord. And we pray for one another this morning, Lord, for those who are struggling, those who are caring for uh, sick relatives, parents, and so on. Oh, Lord, draw near to us. Uh, help us to help one another. And may in your goodness you come among us, Lord, and, and help all those who are struggling. Lord, we thank you that we're a body and we can share this and bring it to you in prayer. So we ask that you be with us as we look at your word together. Please will you speak and help us to listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's sing our second song before we look at the scriptures together. Uh, we'll stay seated for this one, uh, but we will stand for the last one. It's speak, O Lord, as we come to you. It's a favourite of mine because it's such a lovely prayer uh, that God would uh, open up his word to us. So let's uh, have that together now.
Well, having uh, spent the last few months looking at some of the parables and miracles in the life of our Lord Jesus, during these months of July and August, we'll be looking at uh, a series of individual texts, not linked in any way from both Old and New Testaments of the Bible. And uh, it's our prayer and hope that these will bring encouragement and a strengthening and uplifting of our faith as we think about great truths from God's Word. And the first of these is to be found in the book of Zephaniah, one of the so-called minor prophets, minor only in that they are relatively short in comparison with the writings of Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel and Daniel. Now, I have to confess, when I saw that this was my text, I struggled to find the book of Zephaniah um, and got it mixed up with Zechariah. So you're in good company if uh, you, you don't know much about it. So I'd like to try and explain a bit of the context uh, and the background to the prophecy. Are you ready with the first one? Thank you. Um, so there's just a few lines of background there. Zechariah lived during the reign of Josiah, king of Judah. Now the uh, the land of Israel had been split some hundred years before, and the the ten northern tribes had been um, exiled by the Assyrians um, about a hundred years before Zechariah and Josiah were living in in Jerusalem. And uh, Zechariah, uh, Zephaniah, see, got it wrong again. Zephaniah um, prophesied to the people of Judah, and it was a warning um, because some 40 years after he wrote this, Judah was exiled. The, the Babylonians came in and took, the, took them all away, well, most of them anyway. And having read through this book a few times, it's clear that at times he's speaking about what is about to happen to Judah because of her rebellion and her disobedience, and also her return from exile. And uh, you may have noticed at the heading of our reading this morning, it's restoration of Israel's remnant. So the exile uh, would take place, and then some years later, some would return the remnant, the rump, what's left of the people of Israel. So, um, just looking at uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Gather together your, gather together, gather yourselves together, you shameful nation, before the decree takes effect, and that day passes like wind-blown chaff, before the Lord's anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's wrath comes on you. And that is clearly a reference to the coming um, judgment. And um, in chapter 3, a bit further on, um, then her place of refuge would not be destroyed, nor all my punishments come on her, but they were still eager to act corruptly in all they did. So we've got, the Lord, uh, through Zephaniah, the Lord speaking to Judah, but within this there is a more general um, judgment on the whole world and uh, this is quite scary. If, if you've got a Bible, look at uh, the opening few verses of what he has to say. I'm going to lose myself if I'm not careful. Just turned over too many pages. Here we are. Zephaniah 1 verse 2 I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth declares the Lord 
I will sweep away both man and beast. I will sweep away the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and the idols that cause the wicked to stumble when I destroy all mankind on the face of the earth, declares the Lord. So he, he's clearly speaking about a big day of judgment and um, in his writings he talks about that day and he's talking about when God will come in judgment not just upon Israel or Judah but the whole of the world and this is so sort of typical of the prophetic writings in the Bible many of the prophets have this near time and further distant uh, application and, and often it is in relation to the coming Messiah, which is great. It's a lot in Isaiah, as you probably know, about the Messiah. Um, but in, in this particular uh, prophecy, there, there's nothing about directly about Messiah. And these prophecies are, can be intertwined so that sometimes it's difficult to know whether we're, we're looking at what's going to happen to Judah or to the wider world. But although Zephaniah doesn't use, doesn't speak of um, the Messiah, he does use language that foreshadows the ultimate salvation of his people. And in the verses we read, uh, or I read from uh, chapter 3, it, it, it's clear that the, that it, the, uh, the blessings to the returning remnant is not confined simply to the exiles returning to Judah, but um, more generally. Look at verses 12 and 13 of chapter 3. But I will leave within you the meek and humble. The remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. They will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down and no one will make them afraid. Now, although that seems to be talking about the return of the remnant, he's actually talking about God's people going to heaven, because it certainly isn't true of the remnant who return to Israel and the people who live in Israel now, that they will do no wrong, they will tell no lies, the deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down and no one will make them afraid. That is just not true of Israel. It never was and uh, it isn't today. So the prophet is thinking beyond the language of the return of the remnant to the, the ultimate remnant of God's people. I think it's quite helpful to, to get that out. Um, it, it's not the easiest of things to, 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 to um, explain. But to uh, we see in these uh, verses um, the last days when the Lord returns and takes his people to be with him in heaven. So as we come to our text today, which is verse 17, we see it as applying in the first instance to the return of God's people from exile, exile but ultimately it's looking forward to the blessings of salvation when God redeems his chosen ones. Let me just read verse 17 before we go into it. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. A mighty warrior, that's a, an interesting description of the Lord God um, and it, it, it's one that um, actually comes a little earlier in the book of Zephaniah if you look at earlier on I thought I had the reference here yeah 
in verses 14 to 16 of chapter 1. I think that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. The cry on the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty warrior shouts his battle cry. The day, that day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. So the first reference to this mighty warrior is in the first chapter and the, the picture is a battle of, of, of um, a conflict where God as the mighty warrior comes to judge the people. But in verse 17 we have a completely different picture. Um, the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. So we, we've swapped from the, the, the battlefield to salvation. Now why would Zephaniah describe our Saviour as a mighty warrior? <laughs> well, to me the answer surely is that we are and were unable to save ourselves. We were utterly unable to free ourselves from the slavery of sin. We needed a mighty warrior to come to our rescue, someone to deliver us from the punishment our sins rightly deserved. Do you remember when Jesus was um, in Israel? Um, at one point he was accused of driving out demons in the name of Beelzebub. They were really having a go at him. And when he replied, he said these words, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armour in which the man trusted and divides the plunder. And that mighty warrior is our Lord Jesus. He's attacked and overpowered the enemy. He has defeated the devil and he sets us free. And that, so I think the description of him as a mighty warrior who saves is, is, is really good because it shows how powerful and uh, strong he is to deliver us from our sins. And this is something that uh, I think Paul had in mind when he wrote his letter to the Colossians. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And here it is. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So we see Christ is our mighty warrior. He's disarmed the powers and authorities and set us free. I, I get a lot of truth out of some of the songs we sing. And um, as I was preparing, I thought of this song. It's not in uh, many hymn books these days. It's called Praise the Holiest in the Height. And it contains the, this, this line. O loving wisdom of our God, when all was sin and shame, a second Adam to the fight and to the rescue came. So let's this morning praise and worship our God, the Lord our God, because he is the mighty warrior who saves us. But the verse goes on, the first half of uh, the verse the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. And he's with us. And in the, um, in the ESV version of the Bible, it's translated, he is in our midst. He is with us. He's in our midst. He's taken away the punishment that our sin deserved. 
And because we're now his people, he's no longer afar off. He's in our midst, among us, as we meet to hear his word and sing his praise. How easily we can forget this and somehow think he's out there or up there somewhere. Whereas he's with us as individuals and as a church as we meet together. When Jesus spoke to his disciples shortly before his arrest. He said this, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. We were thinking a little bit about that on Thursday at our home group, thinking about the vine and the branches and us remaining in him. So it's an amazing truth, isn't it, to realise that the Lord our God is in our midst. He's with us today. We can't see him, but he's here among us and he's with us as individuals. But surely it's even more wonderful to know that Jesus, by his Spirit, is actually inhabiting our lives. He actually is in us if we're Christians. And I hope that you know this for yourself today. Well, that's the mighty warrior. Let's think about a singing saviour. This is quite a remarkable text and uh, I can understand why it was chosen. Um, because the language now moves from the battlefield to a wedding where the bridegroom extols the praises of his bride, his wife. And what we read here is truly remarkable that the Lord our God should not only be our saviour and be in our midst, but to read that he delights in and loves his people and amazingly rejoices over them with singing. So let's think about these three aspects. First of all, a singing saviour who delights in us. And in fact, it says he delights greatly um, he will take great delight in you. And my thoughts immediately go to the Song of Solomon, um, which uh, comes just after Proverbs in, in, in the Bible. And uh, I don't know whether you've read it or familiar with it, but it's an allegory of the love of Christ for his people. And uh, it's using imagery and language of a bride and groom. And uh, it's quite explicit in places. And there are several long passages where the bridegroom, the man, de declares his delight for his bride. I'll just read one section. I've got my markers in, so I'm all right. Um, it's chapter 6, verses 4 to 9. This is the, the bridegroom speaking of his bride. As I say, this is a picture of the love of Christ for his church. You are as beautiful as Terza, my darling, as lovely as Jerusalem, as majestic as troops with banners. Turn your eyes from me, they overwhelm me. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep coming up from the washing. Each has its twin, not one of them is missing. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. Sixty queens there may be and eighty concubines. Let me turn one page over and virgins beyond number, but my dove, my perfect one, is unique, the only daughter of her mother, the favourite of the one who bore her. The young women saw her and called her blessed. The queens and concubines praised her. 
And that's just one of a number of really beautiful and wonderful pictures of how the, the bridegroom loves his bride and appreciates her and values her. I find that a real problem. How could the Lord Jesus ever think of us as lovely? Because we're not, are we? We do all sorts of wrong things that we shouldn't do. We are inherently sinfulness, sinful. But the reality and truth of God's love is plain for us to see in these verses. This uh, depiction of the love of Christ for his church uh, in terms of a wedding and the groom's love for his bride is one that we also find in the book of Revelation where John describes what heaven will be like following the return of Christ. He says this towards the end of the book of Revelation. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given, for, given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's people. So here we have the same picture of the, the groom, which is Christ, the lamb, reminding us of his sacrifice for us, and the bride has made herself ready. She's She's wearing fine linen, bright and clean, but it was given for her, given to her to wear because of herself, of ourselves, we're not clean, but because of the love and the grace of God, we are made clean. And then in chapter 21, uh, I mean, <laughs> I hope I'm not going too far in saying these things, but here we are. Verse 20, chapter 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among his people. He's in our midst and he will dwell with him. He will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. So this language of uh, Zephaniah finds an echo throughout scripture um, because God is taking great delight in his people. What a wonderful thing to think about. And it's hard to find words to express the debt of love we owe to Jesus our Saviour in the light of his wonderful and unmerited love for us. The second point, it says, in his love he will no longer rebuke you. And uh, if you're looking at the, the notes up there on the screen, it's it says, he quiets us in his love. That's another translation of, of um, this verse. And it's one I think I prefer. So where it says, um, in his love he will no longer rebuke you, um, it, it's carrying the sense of the warfare being ended. The mighty warrior has triumphed in salvation and peace has been declared, and he will no longer rebuke us. Um, there's that lovely passage in one of the Psalms, Psalm 103, um, where the psalmist says, He will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, 
or repay us according to our iniquities. He will not always accuse, he will rebuke us no longer. Peace has broken out because of the cross of Christ. But I think in the sense that he will quiet you in his love brings a slightly different um, sense to it. And, and I think it's this, that the knowledge of his love, his grace and his mercy enables us to live our lives quietly and peaceably. We may be beset with unsettling doubts about what lies beyond the grave or even just next week, what, it, what is it going to hold? But if we know our God who delights in us and quiets us in his love, we can trust him because he's in charge. Or as the, uh, another hymn put it, be still my soul, the Lord is on your side. Be still, we don't need to be anxious, we don't need to fret, we don't need to um, be disquieted because of all the troubles and the difficulties of life. We can be still, we can be quiet in his love and rest content. Well, lastly, let's think about what is qu a quite a remarkable statement. He will rejoice over you with singing. In the book of Revelation, which we touched on, it pictures in, in, in um, picture language the great celebration that will take place when the king in all his glory without a veil is seen and the redeemed of the Lord express their thanks and praise in songs of worship. And if you read the chapters of Revelation, you see time and time again peals of praise bursting out from among the people who are surrounding the throne and they worship and praise God. And uh, we're going to be there, aren't we? But here in Zephaniah, and I think it's the only reference in the Bible, is to the Lord our God singing himself and he's singing because he's rejoicing over his saved people. We speak about God's love, don't we? We're familiar with John 3.16, God so loved the world and so on. But have we grasped the, the reality, the truth, that as a bridegroom delights in the beauty of his bride, so Christ rejoices over his bride the church to such an extent that he sings well God doesn't have a body does he uh, he is a spirit so I think where it says the Lord your God rejoices over you with singing is not to be taken literally it is a picture it is a, an allegory describing his rejoicing over his church, the bride of the Lamb. And this is the same picture, in, in essence, that we have in the prophet Isaiah. As a young man marries a young woman, so your builder will marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so I will rejoice over you. Let me just read that again. And if you're a builder, you ought to take note. As a young man marries a young woman, so your builder will marry you. What a, a wonderful picture of God's love and choice of his bride. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so I will rejoice over you. Well, may these wonderful truths, which I'm struggling to put out because they're, they're so profound, but I hope that you've seen something of the wonder of this verse. The Lord your God is with you. 
the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Well, may God bless that to us. And let's um, stand and uh, sort of sing our last song. It's that song that I quoted, The sands of time are sinking, the dawn of heaven breaks. And it contains those words, The bride eyes not... I can't remember it now. We'll get to it. The bride eyes not her, herself, but her, her king of grace. Let's stand. Let's stand together, shall we?
please sit down and we'll close with a prayer. Our Lord God, we thank you for these truly amazing words that you are a mighty warrior who saves, that you're in our midst, you're among us, that you take great delight in us and in your love you quiet us and you rejoice over us with singing. Lord, help us to praise you and worship you as you deserve and may these words give us hope and courage and strength for the week to come. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>